Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you uh, this afternoon to discuss a very important topic that we call the Great Reshuffle. Some countries call it the Great Resignation and uh, shed some light on the future of work. Now, in the coming 15, 20 minutes while discussing this, I'll be sharing tons of insights coming from our data on LinkedIn. But also, I'll be sharing some um, experiences that you've been trying uh, as company. Um, and uh, we found ourselves in a leading phase where we can talk about it. Now, mind you, uh, the good news is none of us has gone through a pandemic of that size in the past. So uh, we haven't been able to create a playbook yet, and I hope we never will need to do that. Uh, so many of the things that I'll be talking about will be more, more like a trial and error, um, and uh, we'll be able to share about it in the coming 15, 20 minutes. Now, if we look exactly 18 months back, around March 2021, that's exactly the time where we started seeing countries opening up a little bit. We started seeing hotels getting bookings. We started seeing airlines getting uh, uh, operated again. And we started seeing organizations welcoming back in different ways their employees back into the offices. But what we have noticed during that period, we have noticed something very unique, something that we in the past haven't seen, uh, haven't seen it at all in that size and magnitude. We started seeing employees deciding to look at their employment in different ways. In the past, the way you decide on a job Usually, you ask, what am I going to be doing and how much I'm going to be paid? Obviously speaking, not probably every single one asked those two questions, but at large, these are the two questions that people inquire about. That's not what we've seen in March 2021. We started seeing people asking, why do I need to be doing that job? Are my cultures and values aligned with the organization culture and values? And if not, they started taking those brave decisions and handing over the resignation. As a matter of fact, as per McKinsey, during that period, around 33% of the people who resigned did not have another job lined up, which is something unheard of. In the past, you had over your resignation, but you also already negotiated your contract with a different company. To hand over a resignation without even having another job waiting for you, that's something unheard of. And that's what we call the great reshuffle and the great resignation. Now, what we also have seen that um, in the past, as I said earlier, people used to ask about their compensation and benefits as the number one talent driver. That's how employees make their minds whether they're going to change their jobs and go to different employers. That said, now we started seeing in that period that the number one reason for people leaving their jobs is work-life balance. As a matter of fact, the fastest growing priority is flexibility. And when we talk about flexibility, it's not only the flexibility of location. Because many, ma, 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 in many ways, people think like whether I'm flexible to be working from home or working from the office. But when we talk to our members, they say it's the flexibility of location, it's the flexibility of time. I probably don't want to work anymore from 9 to 5. I probably want to work from 12 to 8. That's what we've done during the pandemic for a long period of time. And it did prove to be working. So why to go back to those rigid fixed hours? Even flexibility of communication, flexibility of management style. Anyway, I come from Dubai, and I was having a conversation with one of the um, uh, travel uh, customers of ours. And I was talking to someone from HR, and um, that lady was telling me, what we're experiencing is something that we have never seen in the past. And I was like a little bit you know, curious, like what exactly are you talking about here? We're hiring a lot of people coming, like millennials, Generation Z, and uh, they join our company, and after they finish the onboarding, they started working, and then we send them an email, let's say Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning, many of them never replies. But then when we send a WhatsApp 11 in the evening, two minutes later, we get a response. So that's the flexibility of communication. Employees are telling us that, yeah, maybe in the past emails was a great tool. Many of us, probably I'm one of them, i just very obsessed about my emails. But many others want different type of communication. And those organizations who are able to do that are organizations who are winning in the talent war. Now, it's not as easy, right? If it was as easy, probably more companies would have created those uh, strategies around attracting talent and retaining talent. 
While here in Spain, based on a survey that we have run very recently, we got almost 60% of the people who, who answered the survey, they said if at any point in time their employers asked them to come full time to the office, like 100% working back from the office, 60% of them will hand over their, their resignation on the spot. While those same 60% are telling us, but they are also suffering from work-life balance while they work from home. That line between the personal life and the professional life became so blurry that sometimes you are able to take a, a, a conference call if you're working with international uh, colleagues, maybe at eight o'clock in the evening while you're wearing your pajamas, right? That's what happened during the pandemic. And while people want to continue working from home, they are starting to share some, uh, some moments where it's creating some frustrations. Even more than that, people working from home consistently has reported over 9% more burnouts. And that's not something to take lightly. The mental well-being of people is probably the most important thing that we can... Sometimes we think like it's only about like the physical well-being. Actually, physical well-being can be probably easier managed than the mental well-being. So that's what we call the hybrid work paradox. And why we're calling it a paradox? Because from one side, the employees are telling us, we want to work from home. But from the other side, the same employees are telling us, while working from home, we are feeling more burnouts. We are missing those social skills that in the past we used to gain you know, around the coffee corners during the chit chat from our, employee, from, uh, from our colleagues. And more importantly, many of them started reporting that they are, you know, concerned about their career trajectory, promotions, like they are not spending enough time with their managers, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So if I'm not spending enough time with my manager, then I'm always concerned that perhaps I'm not going to be top of mind when some key decisions are to be made about my career. So that, that, that gap between what the employees want from one side, but what they are experiencing has created that confusion in the market, and we call it today the paradox. Now, how, how did we deal with that as LinkedIn? And as I said earlier, there is no ready-made playbook, the do's and the don'ts, but we decided on one thing. We said trust is the new currency. We're gonna trust our employees to do their best work where it best works for them. And we figured out that having a hybrid work experience is probably the best thing to do. We did not define like you have to be 50% of the time in the office and 50%. We did not put those very hard you know, measures. We said we're going to believe that you're going to be doing your best work where it works for you. And we created what we call the team norms. So a manager will talk to their employees and based on that conversation, they will decide whether probably Monday and Thursday it, it makes sense to be working from the office and the later days working from home. Because we, we quickly discovered one size does not fit all. If you work in sales, I don't want you to be in the office. I want you out there meeting your clients. If you're working in uh, product and engineering, you probably just want to be behind that screen all day long with your ear pods doing some coding work. So I can't expect, depending on where you come from, from which function, that you're all going to behave the same. And so far, it has worked and worked really well for us. Now, that's probably going to change in the future. I don't know. Because what we decided, we're going to be very transparent with our employees and we're going to say, we're going to always revisit. If things are working, we continue. If we find a better way, we will adapt accordingly. But the world today is a little bit different than the world 18 months back. Uncertainty has increased, right? The pandemic is still creeping in, despite the fact that probably many of us are sitting here feeling comfortable without masks, but we still hear that someone is getting COVID and then suddenly we feel like, oh, it's still here. Macro conditions, macroeconomic conditions are not probably the greatest. We're seeing inflation in many countries hitting all-time highs. Energy crisis, war. So I can't think of, of a more time that we're seeing more uncertainties. And that's reflected in our data. So if you look at our data, for instance, we've seen pre-pandemic, that is before the pandemic, remote job did not attract more than maximum 3% of the job applications. Whereas today, 53%. Furthermore, we have seen pre-pandemic that maximum we had 2% on our platforms and we have hundreds of millions of jobs. We had 2% of those jobs 
defined as remote jobs. During the peak of the pandemic, that number went up to 20%, and now it's normalizing at 15%. So, only time will tell whether this number is going to continue to drop, whether it's going to be stable, whether the employers will ask more from their employees to come back to, the, to work from office. But we clearly have seen the pre-pandemic a completely different setup than what we see today. And here's the key thing about it, is that when we talk to employees, they believe 87%, that's a big chunk, they believe they are more productive working from home. But when you talk to their bosses, 80% of them believe that's not true. The gap is getting bigger between what the employer is thinking and what the employee is thinking. And that's not healthy. Actually, that's how you start creating friction. So in a world of uncertainty, the skills required from a leader, from a manager, is a little bit different than the skills that traditionally we were after. And if I'm to summarize, very, very, very high level, I'll probably say the number one skill that is extremely important these days is what we call adaptability. As a manager, as a leader, you need to have those adaptable skills. But what does that mean? When I say adaptability, what exactly do I mean? One, you need to be flexible. And flexible means different things to different people. In the past, as I said, less than 2% of the jobs were remote jobs. So you did not probably need to have that flexibility in managing to proximity. More or less, you have your employees in the same space. Now it's not the case. You might have a couple of employees in the same room, two others joining from different place, three others from different home. And eventually, as a, as a manager, you need to be able to manage that time of relationship between you and your employees. Because what can easily happen, that unconscious bias starts creeping in. If you're spending more time with an employee, seeing that person in the office more and more, chances are when there are some key decisions to be made about promotions, about salary increase, about other, you're probably going to think more about those people that you're spending more time with in the office, which is not necessarily the right thing to do because you always want to manage performance. You're not managing whether you're going to work from office or from home. So, Having that flexibility as a leader in terms of managing people in the same place, remotely, as a leader also having that flexibility to communicate. Communication is key. How do you communicate? What tools do you use to communicate? So flexibility is number one that is really required from an adaptability point of view. Number two will be, and we've heard a lot in the past about and until today, the importance of diversity. I was actually watching a video while waiting uh, for the session to start, and there was like a huge focus uh, about diversity, about how organizations want to hire diverse teams. And we're talking about diversity, we're talking about gender diversity, culture diversity, uh, race, et cetera, et cetera. And it's proven that diverse team wins, right? That's what we know. Actually, diverse organization, gender diverse organization at the leadership level are way more prof profitable than their peers and their stock price outperformed their peers. But we probably haven't talked about a lot in the past is the fact that to have a manager manage diverse team is not as easy as managing a homogeneous team. So if you are to, to, to manage people from different culture, you need to develop those skills that will allow you to talk to people that comes from different nationalities, from different countries, and yet create that inclusive culture. So in addition to flexibility, Diversity is equally important. Now, something which probably come to us as very natural, but in, in reality, probably it's not as practiced, which is, as a leader, you need to be transparent. And sometimes when we talk to our members, some of the things that they share with us, they say, well, during the interview process, my manager told me X, Y, Z, but when I joined the organization, I probably did not experience the same promises I got, which is probably not the right culture that you want to build. Culture is the way you do things, is how you do things, is not what you say, is how you do it. And I think as a leader, being transparent, being honest, with high integrity, will be as needed or more needed than it was in the past. Now, the other point that I will probably spend some time talking about is the skills first mindset. As a leader, you should as well think about the career trajectory of your employees. And you should acknowledge the fact that 
the skills that we had in the past is changing exponentially year after year. As a matter of fact, on LinkedIn specifically, we have over two, uh, north of 300 million skills updated. And those members who update their skills are getting four times more approached by recruiters. Why? Because in the past, organization used to hire based on two things. Your experience, your academic background. Now we started to see companies, in addition to that, adding your skills. So companies are hiring people based on skills. As a matter of fact, we're running a pilot project with, with the government in Singapore where through LinkedIn Learning, we have defined a set of courses that if a candidate goes through that set of courses, we have also some private sector from different industries, including travel and transportation, part of the pilot, that they will, they will guarantee an interview for that candidate if they have passed that LinkedIn Learning path or LinkedIn Learning course. And if they are successful, they get a job. That hasn't been done in the past. And that's the only way where equal talent will get an equal opportunity to land a job. In Spain specifically, in, 20, in 2015, until today, every single year we're seeing the skill sets changing up to 29%. That makes me think, while we are too worried sometimes that uh, I need to develop my skill in order to land my new job. Well, I think you need, we all need to develop new skills to be able to keep our existing jobs. Because if we don't do that, the world is, is, is changing so fast that you will not be able to cope with. And as leaders, you need to recognize that. And you need to coach and encourage that skill-first mindset in your organization. In 2015, if you look, those the most highly on-demand skills in, in Spain. Number one was business strategy. Number five now is business strategy. Troubleshooting, which is very much related to digital and technology, is number one. And those of you who, who follow on the World Economic Forum uh, reports, Recently, the WEF has, has uh, shared a report saying that between now and 2025, less than three years from now, 85 million jobs will be lost to technology. Our data says that in the coming couple of years, over 180 million jobs will be created because of technology. So digitization is the new currency. And if we don't invest in ourselves, and if we're leaders, we don't invest in, in transforming our organization through that digitization journey, it's going to be very tough. But those are the hard skills that we talk about. What's also important is to talk about the soft skills. Negotiations, compassion, leadership. These are all skills that are equally important in the future. Finally, I want to finish by saying that while we always thought that AI is going to come here and displace people and take our jobs. What we have learned is not only about technology. It's about people. It's about the way we think about the skills that we need. I'll finish with an anecdote from a, from a book that uh, I, I've read multiple times. It's called Good to Great. I love that book. And the author, Jim Collins, in one of the interviews with the CEO, he asked the CEO, when is it OK not to hire the best person for the job? And the CEO replies back, it's never. We find a way to make the work as a team until we hire the best person that can do the job today, but also has the growth mindset to learn new skills to be able to do that in the future. Thank you very much for being great listeners, and I look forward to connecting with you later.